Good evening and welcome to tonight's Pasture Project webinar, Understanding Grass-Fed Beef Logistics, Transport, Processing, and Distribution. My name is Pete Huff. I'm a program officer with the Pasture Project, which is an initiative at the Wall of the Wallace Center at Winrock International. I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar. Uh, we're fortunate to have two great presenters with us tonight. Um, the first uh, presentation that we'll hear from is from Rod Ofte. Uh, Rod is the owner of Willow Creek Ranch. He's also the general manager of the Wisconsin Meadows Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative. Um, he is a core team member of the Pasture, team, or Pasture Project and works to lead our Kickapoo watershed work in southwestern Wisconsin. He's a fourth generation farmer uh, who operates his rotational grazing beef operation near Coon Valley. He, he grew up on dairy but left the dairy farm in the 80s and headed off to uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and entered into service and served in deployments in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. Afterwards, he received his MBA from Boston University and spent 25 years in the food industry. He also worked during that time throughout the world, around the world, in Europe, Middle East, and Asia. In 2007, he went back to his farming roots and bought a farm near his homestead in Coon Valley, where he is currently residing. He's also the president of Norse Group Consulting. He markets his finished beef uh, cattle directly to consumers and via the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative. And in his spare time, if he has any, uh, he's work, he works in a lot of different ways, with a lot of different hats. Rod is a fisherman hunter and is a dad to his two girls. So Rod will be our first presenter. We're also joined by uh, Mike Lorenz, who's the CEO of Lorenz Meat. Uh, Mike uh, graduated from University of Wisconsin River Falls with his bachelor's in food science. Uh, he is currently the chairman of the board and the CEO of Lorenz Meat. He's also a member of the Minnesota Association of Meat Processors and spends a lot of time not only running Lorenz Meat, but also doing a lot to support the growth of local meats, both in Minnesota and nationally, and does so uh, through some really unique partnerships with the U.S. Uh, with organizations and agencies like USDA and Land O'Lakes, where they have put together a great curriculum called Branding Your Beliefs and has presented its curriculum in multiple different states to thousands of producers. Uh, so that's a, a great thing to look up. Um, he also uh, does a lot to uh, promote the industry, uh, both on the large and small scale. Previously, he served in a lot of different capacities, uh, chapter board of, the, of directors for the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota, uh, was the treasurer for Minnesota Grown Promotion Council. He was also on the Minnesota Governor's Advisory Task Force for Organic Food, and a board member for the Land Stewardship Project, uh, project and lots of other things. So uh, Mike and Rod uh, wear a lot of different hats and have a lot of experience within grass-fed beef uh, and the logistics that go into the industry. So without any further ado, I'll pass it over to Rod, who can uh, share his side of the presentation on the topic for tonight. Okay, thanks, Pete. Uh, yeah, as Pete said, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, love to see, especially the young and beginning farmers, uh, folks that are new to this stuff. Um, we've been doing this a long time, but I learn something new every day. So um, if you're experienced and new, that's fine too. Uh, unabashed, I am a big fan of, uh, of Mike's. Uh, we do a lot of work together, but uh, I think he's also a good straight shooter and will, will give you anything you need to know from a beginning perspective or a uh, uh, an established producer's perspective. So uh, great to have him on the call with us tonight. So I'm going to talk about six key uh, areas, uh, and it's all going to be from a producer's perspective so that those of you that want to think, okay, what do I need to do as a producer? Uh, that's the way I'm going to talk. Mike's going to give you a very professional opinion from the pr processor's perspective, and that's very important because they are a key part of this pipeline. Um, but uh, we'll all have uh, time for questions at the end. So kicking off uh, planning. So everybody hates to hear this, but yes, planning is extremely important. So number one, have a plan. Um, I can't say how important this is, uh, especially these days when the, the production um, where, where facilities are tight, uh, a lot of state and, state and federal facilities both have uh, many months of waiting in terms of uh, Getting in, uh, getting dates to have your cattle slaughtered. Uh, so you need to think think that through in advance. 
Uh, the good news is uh, finishing cattle on grass is not an overnight feat. Um, you're going to calve these animals. You're going to hold these animals. Hopefully you plan these animals. So good producers know 12 to 18 months in advance, plus or minus a couple of head, what they're going to have to to sell. And the smart ones contract those that far in advance as well. And you can do that. So think that through, contract in advance, and uh, and that'll that'll come back and uh, and give you some rewards. Um, again, a solid plan can help you secure premiums. Um, I can't say how many times as the general manager of the co-op, we've had people call us, hey, we've got 100% grass-fed beef. We've been working on this for a number of years. They're great cattle, and we need to ship yesterday because they're 29 months. Bad answer. Uh, just, you know, you just you, you give out your heart to those folks, but it's poor planning, and poor planning equals poor performance. Um, you know, they need to get in the co-op a year or two years in advance, or at least have uh, its sales channels secured. Because if you don't have those sales channels secured, you need to sell yesterday. You call your state plant, they're four months backed up. Guess what happens? You sell to the, uh, you know, the, the plant down the road, and you're going to get conventional pricing, and you're probably going to get a, a price you're very disappointed with. So um, that point there, a solid plan will make the difference between you getting market prices, which are you know, break even or less, or premiums, which will actually help your your uh, program uh, survive and thrive. So let's talk about staging a little bit. Um, so staging means, uh, you know, getting your, your animals ready as those days come closer to the actual shipment date. Um, sometimes the staging days may vary. Sometimes they may not, but if you rotationally graze as you should, um, you know, it's not always just black or white uh, day one or day two. You're going to have a rotational grazing pastures. You're going to have backup pastures. So make sure your pastures have a rotational plan around your grazing needs and your staging needs so that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, work towards those, those goals. Um, have a number of holding pens. Um, initially, when I built our holding pens, we just had one because um, that's all I thought I needed. But as you uh, start staging, you're going to see that all of our finishing cattle we keep in the same group. Well, those are year year group cattle, so there's six to 12 months difference sometimes, um, and you need to be able to kind of keep them together as a group, but also be able to peel them off. So have a number of holding pens when you build your holding pen area uh, around your splitting group. Also, uh, understand the potential outcomes of commingling cattle. Initially, this is very very naive, very uh, uh, you know, hey, yeah, Mr. Neighbor, bring on your cattle down and we'll we'll help you out. Just leave them here overnight. Um, these days, some of the diseases are extremely dangerous. So uh, things like Joni's disease, uh, pink eye, other things that may require you to treat your whole herd. If you are you get an outbreak of pink eye without antibiotics, that may pull a large number of your animals out of uh, the antibiotic-free um, protocols. So make sure you know whose cattle are coming, you know, where they're from, what are their standards, what are their genetics, what's their, what is their health record before you start commingling cattle uh, just out of, uh, you know, being a good neighbor. Lastly, stockpiling forages just to support extended staging. Um, the, the stock, the paddocks that are closest to our farm, which are normally the ones that are most beat up, are actually, in our case, the most uh, rested. Uh, we do that because sometimes we have cattle here, they're staged, and all of a sudden uh, needs change, and we have to keep them for another week or another two weeks. While we like to keep them close to the farm, but still on fresh pasture. So keeping stockpiled forage close to the barn or close to the uh, staging area is a very smart idea that can help you in the long term. So move on to loading. Um, another super important piece uh, in the big picture um starting off with the first one you can't uh you can't build the loading shoes too strong um it's kind of like a fence uh the second you think you've built it strong enough uh one leaps over and you found that you've got a bruce jenner high jump uh, record setting cattle uh but they do that when they're getting under pressure cattle will cattle will jump so you need to have extremely strong extremely tall shoots um, and do that in advance just to avoid issues because if something breaks or you can't get cattle down I can't say how many times I've been to you know new and beginning producers to load cattle and all of it all they've had is a couple of gates and a, and a to the regular wire fence. Uh, it's just not enough to load cattle. So make sure you got a good loading chute. 
Uh, ideally have two people present, and this is the old safety first rule. Uh, good cattle people can load uh, cattle by themselves, and they'll do it over and over and over again. But I've seen firsthand a number of times when, you know, I've had the guts to pester my wife to help me load at four in the morning, and she's always just a saint to do that. But there's been a couple of times where, you know, I've turned my head, a cattle's kick, it hit the gate, the gate hit my chest, it laid me out. And if my wife wasn't there to lo close that door, I would have been dead. And uh, so, again, safety first, always, always, always have two people present, even if you're experienced, even if you think you can load by yourself. Uh, again, it's not worth uh, paying the ultimate price. So uh, safety first, always have two people there. Minimize potential distractions. That's uh, another simple thing, but uh, uh, we've loaded when we've had, uh, you know, just family and kids out to the farm kind of chasing the chickens and things. And cattle get worked up pretty pretty easily. So, you know, kids screaming, chickens cackling, running around. Even our uh, our pigs, we rotate in the center of our, uh, our cattle pasture uh, towards the, the, uh, the cattle pen. And they're extremely amused by pigs and they'll be distracting and just make them nervous. So try to minimize those potential distractions will make loading a lot easier. Um, something I've had a lot of friends talk about, re rehearse loading to reduce stress. I've got some people I buy feeders from and they talk about they rehearse loading and I kind of thought it was a joke, but um, their cattle are incredibly docile. They get in and out of trailers without a problem. And what they say is they they kind of like I, I do with our cattle to keep them uh, responsive. I give them treats and bang on a bucket when I come out to see them. And they're always positive about that uh, interaction. Folks, uh, when they come back in the into the cycle, they have the, their trailer loaded back up in there. And they just maybe have the treat bucket and the bucket or the pail uh, or the feeding uh, apparatus inside the trailer. So the cattle come inside, they go out and they learn to understand that that's, that's you know, really a, a positive experience and it makes loading a lot easier. I didn't believe that until I kind of reflected on every time I opened the trailer for my bull and every time I opened it, you know, cattle never wanted to go in the trailer, but when I opened the trailer for the bull, he can't get in there fast enough. <laughs> and uh, obviously, you know, he's, he's learned to understand that there's a very positive experience for him on the other side of that, uh, that trailer. So he, he's, uh, he's a very positive loader and I can't get the door open fast enough for that guy. So the point is, uh, uh, reinforcing positive experiences for loading can reduce the stress of that experience. Uh, plan for your weight and space limits, uh, especially for a young and beginning farmer, talk to your loader, talk to your hauler. Uh, how many cattle do you have? What are their weights? Um, we, we've had people talk about, uh, Hey, I've got, uh, you know, eight eight feeders and they're ready to go, a small trailer would be fine. Well, the feeders were not 500 pounds, they were 800 pounds and you can't get them on a six animal trailer. So talk through your weights and space limits to make sure that animals, both for their safety and for yours, last thing you want is an animal getting trampled or something like that, uh, have plenty of space um, and also don't uh, overweight uh, the trailer. Have your documentation ready in advance. Uh, when, when you do ship, there's a lot of stress, a lot of things going on, especially in a branded program like going to Mike's facility in uh, uh, Cannon Falls. Uh, I always have that documentation done the, ready, the night before and signed, uh, and ideally in the truck, so that if I get distracted or whatever, it's there. Um, a lot of these places, especially in a branded program, or if you're an FSI, uh, USDA approved, 100% grass fed label, they will not slaughter your cattle without those documents. And, you know, to ru rush, rush, rush and fax and whatever else, sometimes it's too late. So always have your documentation ready uh, in advance will be a good, uh, good experience for you. Um, use cattle loader friendly corral design. Um, you know, unfortunately in our co-op, uh, Goodwill you go there to help a friend and next thing you know, they you're just backing up to a corner with a wired fence. You need something that's good both for the cattle and good for safety and good for the uh, corralling uh, function that you're working. I really highly recommend progressivecattle.com. A ton of really neat designs, uh, safe structures, um, and designs that are good both for the cattle and and uh, and, and the uh, the people that are loading them. Uh, Temple Grandin, you've probably all heard of that. Uh, Temple Grandin is very famous for animal friendly uh, loading designs and ideally the rainbow design. 
that's what we use. Uh, but there's also good and bad ways you can implement that uh, that structure. So um, check out progressivecattle.com and grandin.com uh, to understand and make sure that your uh, corral, the corral designs are uh, animal friendly and user friendly. All right, so let's talk about shipping. And again, everything I'm talking about here is a, is a producer perspective. Uh, Michael built a lot on processing, but I want to give you processing inputs from a, from a producer again. And as we will talk about now, shipping. So first, check out your service product provider in advance. Um, you might get a friend of a friend of a friend that'll tell you, hey, so-and-so hauls cattle, here's his number. But you know what? Find out, is the person licensed? Is the person reliable? Does the person have a good driving record. Um, all those things are extremely important to make sure your animals arrive safe. Um, when you, especially when you're crossing at, uh, borders, if they, if you're not um, certified and have a DOT number, those folks can potentially be turned around and sent back. So you don't want to find any bad surprises uh, a little bit too late. Always plan for holiday or weather events. Uh, unfortunately, in the upper Midwest. Um, it's not that uh, infrequent that we're either working around 4th of July, we're working around Christmas, we're working around Labor Day. Um, and our, our uh, Mike's facility is extremely good about that. Uh, but you know what? If the weather's really bad, they may take cattle early. You might want to ship early. You might want to be able to ship late or they might make exceptions a bit late. So think through, uh, look, look at weather and think through weather and holiday events. Again, I said ensure proper doc uh, certification and documentation are present. Um, especially if you're sending cattle that are being killed in the USDA facility under a FSIS, 100% grass-fed farm traceable label. If they don't have the documentation, they can't kill that animal. So you need to make sure that documents, uh, documentation is present. And then lastly, provide sufficient trailer space. Um, it's always tempting to pack another animal in, but you know they can get hurt on the way. And unfortunately, it's happened to me where you know, you're a little tempted, you want to throw another one on, it's that much more money, it's that much more efficiency in the hauling. Somebody goes down and guess what? Somebody doesn't get back up. And then at the USDA facility, if the animal doesn't get back up, they can't be slaughtered. And uh, what ends up happening is that animal comes home and you get absolutely zero uh, for that. And uh, you really regret that you ever ever done it. So uh, long story short, again, always make sure you've got plenty of uh, trailer space in there to make sure your animals arrive safely and in good shape. Okay, on to processing. Uh, again, this is from a producer perspective. And uh, first of all, understand your, your packaging and labeling needs and your processing prices well in advance. Um, a lot of folks come into it, the first thing they do is say, okay, I want X price or I need X price. And they don't even understand what their processing costs are. Um, you do need to understand that different processors are extremely different. Uh, USDA processors are very different versus a state plant versus a vacuum, a sealed plant versus a cut and wrap plant. So make sure you understand that in advance. Understand your, uh, your, your labeling needs. If you've got a pretty fancy label and you really want every consumer to interact with that, uh, and you expect the processor to put that on, make sure you've talked through that because oftentimes they will charge you to put that label onto a pack. Do you require a USD plant or a state plant? Uh, that might sound like a simple question, but in the United States, if you do transfer across state lines, you need a USDA plant or a, a state plant that is USDA equivalent, which will be, be mean that they'll have a, a, a state number, but a round seal, a round USDA plant seal. Um, you know, again, sounds like bureaucracy, you know, gibberish rules, but those things can really shut a program down. And if you get caught shipping state plant product across state lines and delivering that product, you can get fined thousands and thousands of dollars. And I unfortunately know uh, distributors who have done it accidentally and still been fined thousands and thousands of dollars. So please make sure you understand uh, before you go to a USD plant or, and or a state plant and where you're shipping, um, what kind of seal you have on that product. Uh, On-farm slaughter is becoming more and more popular these days. We do it ourselves, we love it. Um, however, very big uh, implications linked to farm on-farm slaughter. In Wisconsin, when I do an on-farm slaughter, uh, we coordinate the on-farm slaughter with a uh, local state processor. Uh, they do not have a kill floor, so they work with the on-farm slaughter kill team. However, that goes to his plant, and then that is ex uh, exclusively designated for 
my personal consumption. It's marked over and over again, not for resale. And despite being very good friends with the owner, he is extremely nervous and says to me at least a hundred times each time I process there, Rod, you can't sell this, you can't sell this, you can't sell this, you can't sell this. So again, uh, if you're planning on growing your big business and getting into high dollar, you know, farm direct, et cetera, et cetera, on-farm slaughter sounds really good, especially from a low stress perspective, but think through the resale implications because you may not be able to resale all of that product. So one of my favorite discussions with processors is hanging time. So uh, it's extremely good modern uh, marketing these days. If you get into a really high-end restaurant, you might even hear gibberish like 200 days dry aged. <laughs> and that's, it probably is ridiculous, but um, historically, people have let their animals hang and let let uh, the carcasses dry age. Uh, and really, what it is is the enzymes and the carcasses breaking down, adding flavor, adding tenderness to the process. However, uh, hanging time, especially for small state plants that don't have a lot of storage facility, is simply not in their interest. So, you need to think through in advance um, what are you going to um, what are you going to do with the end product? If you're going to freeze it, that's fine, but you may want to hang it and make sure you talk that through the processor. Um, if you're going to go into retail, like 80% of the aggressive beef co-ops businesses retail, uh, Mike at Lorenz, they, they process within 48 hours of killing because the retailers want it still moving more or less, and they want it very fresh. So think through your business. Is it custom? Is it food service? Is it retail? And uh, have the appropriate processing solution. Um, have your customer cutting instructions ready. Um, I know this sounds like, oh, we've got plenty of time, but having done hundreds and hundreds of custom halves, um, you can't reach people. Next thing you know, the processor's on your back. It's always good. We, what we do is we take a, we do a lot of fielding of questions. There are a lot of tire kickers, like all of us will. And once somebody says, you yeah, know, I really want to move forward with this, the first thing we do is take a deposit. And a deposit shows that somebody is very serious and uh, they're committed to the process. So once we have a deposit, right after that, we take their cutting instructions. So traditionally, two to three to four weeks later after that, getting that deposit, we'll um, have the animal cut. That gives us plenty of time to get those cutting instructions um, uh, well in advance of, of the processor being anxious to cut the animal. Second, wraps the processing. So lastly, distribution, uh, another big one here, but uh, um, ideally have a distribution solution in uh, uh, up your sleeve well before that you plan to ship live animals. Um, are you gonna do it frozen? Are you doing it fresh? Are you doing it to retail? Think those things through. Frozen is extremely forgiving. Uh, it lets you wait. Um, if you can't get a hold of them, you can't get a hold of you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would highly recommend it, but a lot of the markets these days are looking for fresh. So make sure you understand what you've committed and that you have a way to deliver it uh, appropriately. Um, the distribution solution is the face of your brand. I've, I've seen very often in the trade, uh, positive and negative. You know, we have a, uh, the grass fed beef has a branded uh, truck. It's very clean and it's very cool. It's very, you know, the, the truck says everything we want it to say. And that's the face of our brand. And we have all kinds of referrals where people say, hey, you know, I don't know much about it, but I saw your truck on the road and it looks so good. And I saw the number and I want to call and I want to try grass fed. Those are positive experiences. I've also had restaurants call me saying, hey, we, we want grass fed. We've been doing grass fed. But the guy that's delivering to us comes up in a rider truck. It's not refrigerated. It's got, you know, faded branding on the side and it looks like a fly by night deal. And yeah, he's cheaper than you are. but you know what, we, we want to move on and we want to get more professional. So, you know, whatever you're delivering in is the face of your brand. So make sure that is professional and, and reflects the uh, professionalism and the brand quality you want to have. Uh, that said, you don't have to have a super duper uber chilled truck. However, ensure that your temps are below 40 degrees. Um, if you are temped, temperature checked, and all, all retail outlets often do that just out of standard practice. If you're above 40 degrees, they can reject your shipment. Uh, we have had competitors that have been rejected for that. And, you know, usually folks will give you a, a leeway once or twice, but you do that multiple times, it begins to be a food safety, which gets to be a risk on their end. 
and uh, and they really won't give you a lot more leeway there. So ensure that you've got capabilities to deliver those products well below 40 degrees consistently. Uh, again, ensure you understand the uh, documentation when crossing state lines. Um, this is not just a you know minor thing. Not a lot of people talk about it, uh, but we have seen some dis distributors on the, in the grass-fed beef co-op. And also, it's kind of sad because it was very, very innocent on their part. Um, we had a distributor that just delivered to Woodman's, and Woodman's are outlets uh, 90, 95% across Wisconsin. They had one or two outlets in Iowa. At the time, we had an Iowa, we had a Wisconsin-only uh, uh, product, and uh, some inspector found it in Iowa with a Wisconsin state seal on it and fined him fifty thousand dollars. So <laughs> that's a big deal, and uh, they had to pay, pay that fine, and uh, it was unfortunate. But you know, obviously, it was out of our control; and it was their fault. But it was totally, um, you know, non-intentional, and uh, they weren't trying to uh, sneak by things. But make sure your product does not get. Uh, caught up in something like that because uh, depending if you're doing the distribution yourself that $50,000 could come back on you so and Lastly understanding your consumers needs in advance uh, uh, When you're talking and when you're in the wedding phase and in uh, real positive about all the kind of things that are developing How many times a week are you going to deliver? How fresh is the product? Is it frozen? Uh, how, much, uh, how much lead time do you need orders? Those are really, really critical things, and sometimes it might end the honeymoon, but you'd rather end it uh, well, well in advance before you've got a lot of product in the pipeline and find out, you know, this isn't what exactly what I thought it was and what they thought it was. So make sure you understand your customers' needs and, uh, and the commitments you're both making to each other. A um, couple are all very helpful, a document with the FSIS, USDA, go, gov, uh, uh, website. Um, if you want to make certain claims, um, all natural vegetarian diet, there's a lot of claims that are very uh, generic and they're very unharmful um, that you can make without any kind of documentation. If you want to say 100% grass-fed beef, you do need an FSIS approved label. I do need to send that into FSIS in advance. Uh, similar to organic, uh, FSIS does approve, uh, approve and kind of police those things. And then, uh, again, we, we do work with Mike's facility uh, when we send something there and he puts a 100% grass-fed uh, label on our case, he needs to approve the FSIS standard. So he looks at our protocol, he double checks uh, farm shipping records, make sure it's fully farm traceable, that the protocol is undersigned and all those kind of things are, are met. So if you do want that claim, make sure you understand what those FSIS uh, standards are. So lastly, uh, there's my uh, my email and my uh, website and all that happy stuff. Um, happy to help any kind of young, small, medium-sized producers, uh, grass-fed or not, uh, get all kinds of calls. And I just am um, excited that there's folks that are interested in joining the, the movement and um, interested in finding something that can help uh, keep sustainable family farms alive. So happy to chat with you anytime you have any questions uh, or any way I can help. So. That's my contact information, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Pete and uh, give her over to Mike. Great, Rod. Thanks for that. Um, just a quick note before we transition on to Mike's presentation, um, just to remind folks to submit their questions. Rod covered a lot of material there from the producer's perspective. Um, so as you have questions for Rod, make sure that you go ahead and use that questions function on the control panel so that you could submit your questions and we'll get to those after Mike's presentation. So uh, uh, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Mike, and uh, transfer control and you can walk through your presentation with us. Great, thanks, Pete. Well, um, Rod, thanks. Good job. Um, Rod is in a unique situation where he does all sorts of different types of stuff from the locker plant sides and quarters to the fully branded stuff. So as I'm thinking about the uh, question for this evening about um, logistics and distribution, it really depends on what your program is. It depends on what the solutions you should apply when it comes to these things. So I think it's really important um, from my perspective that um, I start out by saying that 
there is no wrong answer on many of these things that success is self-identified so I see big uh, big programs that are um, not successful and I see little programs that are greatly successful and some people have started to think that we're a big plant and I look at the world and see how small we are and you know these are all relative terms so um, the important thing is that you have defined what your success is and you have uh, developed a program that helps you achieve that success. So with that, um, I've started out with a Wendell Berry quote there. That's That greets you when you walk into our building. Here's a quick picture of our building that's currently 30,000 square feet. We're in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. We have about 120 employees at that location. We're partners in a facility that we own 50% of in Vermont called Vermont Packing House. I mean, two boomerangs are partner there. We have 60 employees there. In Minnesota, we just slaughter bison and beef, and we make sausage out of all proteins, and we do specialty packaging of all proteins. In Vermont, we slaughter beef and hogs, and we uh, make sausage out of all proteins, and we specially package all proteins. So I just brought a, I, I just put up a couple slides here, so you get a little bit of a sense of the scope of our business here. Like I said, this is our building. You know, here's some uh, beef that are hanging in our cooler. Um, uh, still do a, an awful lot of work by hand. There's not much automation in the business. Um, we do have some of the uh, roll stock machines. We actually are up to um, uh, three roll stock machines in each facility right now. This packaging, I think, is one of the packagings that's really first class, but the the machine comes with a lot of, a lot of cost and a lot of uh, support infrastructure required, and we make sausage. So anyway, that's a little bit about us. So now about your program. Um, you know, as I think about it again, your your success is self-identified. So how do you scale up to whatever your definition of success is? So I think there's four major components that you have to be thinking about. First, you think about supply. You know, are you only going to take animals off your farm? Or are you going to take animals off of other people's farms and become an aggregator? You have technical expertise. The big one, like Rod said, is your processing infrastructure. Who takes care of advising you on that, on your yields, on your label approvals? all that kind of stuff. It's capital. Um, you can, uh, in certain programs, you can get a lot of capital tied up and then the market. So those are the four things that you're thinking about as you're moving forward and defining the success of your program. Uh, determining the scale is so critical because if you're too big, you're guaranteed to fail because most likely you're going to run out of cash before you get up on plane. And if you're too small, you're probably not sustainable. You're you're most likely um, going to be uh, living some sort of lie where you just can't quite get ends meet. So you got to find that right spot for you. So the scale that you you ultimately uh, select is a function of the four components. Um, so let's first look at supply in the market. The first uh, the first reality that you'll find is the market is fully served. There isn't anybody that needs meat more than they can get at the four different outlets that they go by. I mean, for goodness sake, Quick Trip has uh, a selection of meat now. So there's all sorts of different places you can buy meat. And as much as people talk about they want their um, um, high attribute uh, products, that a lot of them um, just are so stressed for time, they buy what's convenient. So the market is fully served to that, uh, uh, and it's hard to get in. Uh, purchasers in the conventional markets are consolidated. You know, if you go to, a, if you think you want to go up and sell to the grocery stores in the Twin City area, which I'm near here, um, you'll find that there's a very few number of people that control the vast majority of the meat that goes into these stores. And supply is limited by the special claims. One of my favorite customers is a really small guy that focuses on farmers markets, and this is a little bit of an aside because. Um, if people ask me about farmer's markets, I tell them I hate farmer's markets for meat, um, which I could go into a long story, but summarize it as the margins in selling meat are too small to justify the time that's required to do a farmer's market. But anyway, I've got one customer that's just a diehard um, farmer's market guy. He probably does 50, maybe let's say 30 to 50 beef a year, and he does certified organic, 100% grass-fed Scottish Highlander beef. 
well, this is a guy whose supply chain is limited because there's not a lot of those animals out there that he can uh, source. If he outsells his supply, there's not somebody he can go have fill in. So technical expertise and capital. Um, like Rod said, the prime, one of the big technical expertise is processing that's going to limit your success of a marketing program. But of course, you have an infinite amount of technical expertise required to make quality animals too. So um, I, I don't mean to disregard that. When I talk about technical expertise in this um, sense, I'm taking your quality animals that you've already done an excellent job on and getting at the rest of the way to the customer and the capital required to do it. So expectations of technical expertise are growing rapidly. Um, our plant in Minnesota, um, we, we have a uh, third-party food safety audit um, that's called SQF, um, and it's part of the Global Safety Food Initiatives. And this is a big-time international audit that all the, all the smart food people got together and said these are the minimum standards you have to do, and if you come to our facility, um, the latest and greatest thing is not only can you not walk out on the floor without having a hairnet and a frock and your jewelry off and all in your hands washed and all these other things, but now you have to read a document and take a test on it to show that you understand that you're not supposed to touch anything. Um, these are the expectations that our customers are putting on us um, as we um, go out to market. So if you're going to retailers, the retailers keep expecting more and more of the USDA processing facilities. USDA alone just isn't enough. And then the other thing around capital is cash is king. I see so many of our small uh, customers and small distribution companies struggle um, because they can't, uh, they don't have the capital to finance the operation that they need to need to run. So some of the lessons that we've learned over the years, um, any component that's not owned by the organization is expensive to acquire. So if uh, you want to go out and hire somebody to run your marketing company, you're going to have to pay them a lot of money if you don't know anything about it. If you want to buy a processing plant because you're not happy with it, well, to acquire that technical expertise is very expensive. So the things you don't know are going to be very expensive for you. All the component, all four of those components are dynamic. If you have, um, uh, if you're really, really good at one, um, you can be not so good at the other, and you can still have a successful program. Tenacity is indispensable. Um, there was many times over the years that we were told to stop or quit or we can't do that, and uh, my brother and I kept knuckling down and kept finding ways. Inventory is the biggest threat to profit. Um, uh, that is what it is. You know, most uh, most people that start uh, branded programs that start selling pieces and parts, and this is also part of the reason why I don't like farmers markets for small farmers, um, because the inventory challenges of having too much chuck roast or too much round meat in the freezer um, ultimately is a threat to profit because you end up discounting it and you didn't sell it for the price you thought you were going to do it. And it's a threat to cash flow because you have all your money in the freezer. Or as some of our branded programs like to call it the chamber of hope. If you don't think you can sell it, put it in the chamber of hope. So get your scale, uh, the scale for the correct and know your partners. Um, I like to tell people to either look at doing 100 beef or less where you're selling directly to the person that's consuming the product. Again, focusing on utilizing whole carcasses, selling bundles, selling sides, quarters, whatever, but keep your program small and profitable without a lot of distribution and logistics. I mean, if you can get them to, you know, like for our customers, if you have a small program and you can get the animals to us, your customers can come to us and pick them up. Um, so keep it small and simple or be a thousand beef or more and um, now you can live between a hundred and a thousand but what my what I'm proposing here is that size is a lot a lot of work and you probably aren't going to generate the margins to justify the staff to justify that amount of work and once you get over a thousand you're starting to generate the revenue that you can actually um, afford the infrastructure that you need to do a full branded program. And you can supplement this by doing beef and pigs and beef and pigs and chickens. So I put in here one beef equals three hogs, equals six lambs or goats or 100 chickens. It's 
what I'm trying to get at is you need a um, certain uh, uh, a, enough girth in your business that you can control the margins that you can have people focusing on doing the work they need to do to keep the inventory in balance. So just some final thoughts before we um, open it for questions. Um, building a processing plant is a lost resort. I get calls from farmers all over the place that they don't have a processing plant nearby and they want um, want me to help them um, do a processing plant and it takes a disappointingly large number of pounds to run through a processing plant to have the infrastructure you need to do a good job um, with uh, everything you need to know and often and so what so many of you know and working with local plants is it's a tough business to generate enough money you know the the big guys out there um, are doing their work for the drop they can make enough money off the hide and the blood. They don't have to put any money on the meat. Um, if you go to a small processing plant that charges you $400 to do the work uh, and you get 400 pounds of meat off that beef, you're a dollar a pound in the hole and you haven't even started yet. Uh, God forbid you pay yourself a premium and then you have a just uh, um, a non-efficient distribution system. It's really challenging and if you think you're going to solve it by having uh, control of an inefficient processing plant, that really has to be the last resort. Work together to find solution. Ask a lot of questions. You know, Rod was really good about that in his presentation. Ask questions for everybody, um, especially for your processor. And um, unfortunately, I have to tell you all, don't believe the first processor you talk to. Some of my peers don't know what they're talking about. Um, embarrassing to say, but you know they've never really been challenged on some of the things you're asking them to do, and they got their own little deal, and um, they're not proposing to try to support you in your branded program. They just got their little deal. That's why it's got their name on the door. Everybody in the value chain has to make money. Um, uh, this is really important to me that we do everything we can do to help our farmers make money because um, if they don't make money, they don't pay their bill. If they don't pay their bill, we don't get to grow. We don't get to keep doing it. And I hope that my customers all are concerned about me making money um, so I can continue to keep the door open so I can provide the service that ne they need to do to make um, their program successful and empower people to help. This kind of ties into the ask questions. but. Um, you'd be surprised what you can get out of asking people just for their help. And um, if you know a successful business person, ask them about cash flow and inventory control and, and all that kind of stuff. And you'll be really surprised on how much, um, how much help you actually get. So those are my, uh, those are kind of my organized thoughts. I would, I do want to um, give a shout out to, um, Organic Valley, who's our financial partner, um, you know, my I, I think I'll just touch briefly on this. I should have maybe said at the beginning, but my mom and dad started our processing plant in 1968. It was a custom exempt plant. I grew up in stamping everything not for sale, like Rod said. In 1997, my brother and I took over, and in 97, my brother Rob killed every animal we killed and made every pound of sausage we made. In 2000, we built that processing plant that I showed you a picture of, first 10,000 square feet. And then in 2012, and to do that, we leveraged friends and family. We had probably 12 or 14 investors that gave us a bunch of money. Um, we built the processing plant. We proceeded to lose it all, just held on to enough to keep ourselves in business somehow miraculously, barely. And um, made it through the other side of that. And in 2012, we were looking to add on and Organic Valley invested in us. And now they own 66% of our business. And my brother Rob and I own the other 34%. And I will tell you in all honesty, um, but for all of our great partners, uh, Thousand Hills Cattle Company, Wisconsin Grassfed, High Plains Bison, you know, Crop Organic Valley, um, uh, we wouldn't be where we are without their support. So that's my, uh, those are my thoughts, and I'm looking forward to hearing questions. Great. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. We'll um, switch back to uh, my screen here so that we can uh, move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. So again, thank you both for the presentations. And we do have plenty of time now for some questions. And want to just as you all are thinking of great questions and getting ready to submit them want to 
remind you of how to do so. So if you, on your screen, you should see your control panel. And on that control panel, you should see a questions section. And within that, uh, you should be able to enter in any question and that'll come directly to me. And I'll ask out to uh, Mike and Rod to provide some insight on that. So again, submit your question. Uh, now's a good time. We do have plenty of time to get through questions uh, on tonight's topic. So uh, first question, uh, and this could potentially be for both Mike and for Rod, uh, is a question around that 100 and 1,000 uh, scale that you mentioned, Mike. And the question is, is it possible to move uh, from one of those to the other, from 100 to 1,000? Uh, is the only way to do that is by working through something like a cooperative or some kind of aggregation program with other producers to be able to accomplish that? Or is it possible to do that on your own? And if so, what are the steps that are needed for you know, working together in a cooperative or an, with an aggregator? And what are the process or the, some of the suggestions for doing that on your own, if at all? Well, sure, you can do it on your own. The one, the, the one example uh, nationwide that comes to mind is uh, White Oak Pasture. You know, Will Harris has done an excellent job doing it all by himself, and he owns his processing plant. He does way more than the equivalency of a thousand head, um, but he's got a fifth generation farm there that he could leverage the equity on, and he had years of uh, uh, beef farming genetics, and he had a ton of beef, and he could do it on his own. It's it's a big ask to see somebody that would own a thousand head and or, or that could finish a thousand head annually and do the sales. So I would typically see that as some function of aggregation where multiple processors and what Rod is doing with Wisconsin grass fed is a perfect example of how you can collectively get together um, and achieve that goal and still do some of the, uh, you know, other other things on the on the side as well. So um, yeah, it's a big deal, but it takes a it, it takes a lot of volume to to justify a branded program. Rod, do you have any perspective on that on the on the challenges and opportunities of moving into that those that thousand range by working together? I know I think Mike nailed it on the head. I, I guess I would say that, you know, we grew very slowly into our state plant business, which is custom and it's it's high cost, high maintenance, high service, which is a fine model, but it's two, six, eight, ten head of the crack. So I think Mike Mike gave the other example good. But you know, if you really are small, you can make money. Um and then do the do the high end piece, uh dry age it. Um Take individual cutting instructions per half, and all those things where you can really add value, because despite dropping beef prices, we've not decreased our beef uh, hanging weight price since 2014, and I've never had anybody challenge us on it, which is amazing. But beef prices are down 30, 40 percent from the highs. But when you sell hanging weight and it's an individual experience, and you show them your farm, people are much less likely to kind of you know challenge and try to you know, bring you down 10, 20, 30 cents. So if you're small scale, sell it high, sell what you're unique at, sell what you're good at, sell the differentiation. And then to Mike's point, if you want to get in the mainstream and, and really get those synergies, um, I'll tell you right now, Mike, he does an amazing job. The Crowdback is world-class and he is half of the price of our state plant. Okay. Not bashing them, but they're smaller scale, the da, 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 da. But he is a, that's a world-class facility that gives us the synergies to produce on a large scale. And we couldn't do everything we do there if he was twice the price. So, uh, but he is that twice the price because he's got uh, functions. He's got HACCP, he's got flows, and he's got processes that you need to be able to work within. So, um, you know, again, just understand what's right for you. And uh, maybe to start out with, the, the mom and pop down the road, state plan is fine. But if and as you grow, and especially if you want to get in, into farmer's markets or have something sellable there in those synergies, you want something crowd backed and something a bit higher quality. So that's all I'd add to that. Great. Thank you both. So another question here uh, uh, is asking, what time frame do you typically look for from loading to slaughter for low stress handling?
Well, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, loading the slaughter, ideally, it's minimal. Uh, for what we try to eat ourselves, um, we'll traditionally do an on-farm slaughter just because it's zero stress. So here's the principle, folks. If any of you are deer hunters, and if any of you have eaten the, the, the big buck that's ran miles and miles and miles, you know adrenaline has an impact on meat, taste, meat, consistency, meat, uh, tenderness, texture, et cetera. Um, and the same thing happens when animals are really high stressed in a long, long haul period. Ideally, we like to do under two hours. Um, we may not always do that because we're, we're a co-op and we can't use multiple facilities, but that's, I guess, what I've heard and what we try to do. And then if we haul longer than two hours, uh, and Mike is great at this, uh, their facilities open the night before, and they've got amazing feeding, storage, hay, you know, feed, water, fresh water, get them in there, let them relax, let the animals call down, they're with other animals, they're in a nice facility, and let everybody de-stress. So I guess that's what really the key is, you know, the distance is important. If you have to bridge those two hours, uh, try to work with a partner like Mike that has great facilities, let the animal come in the night before, and, uh, you know, otherwise, ideally, uh, two hours or less. Uh, anything to add to that, Mike? Yeah, we like to try to follow Temple Grandin's suggestions that you either either get them in and do them or you get them in and hold them 12 hours. So um, I don't know that Temple's recommendation is dependent on when you load them. Her recommendation is more when you unload them. Um, so anyway, that's kind of our uh, position. I would like to say that um, Rod is being overly kind with the the work that we do i can i can probably give you a list of uh, uh, a relatively long list of people that will tell you how difficult we are to work with at lawrence meets um, and some of that difficulty comes from uh, years of experience uh, working with these branded programs and knowing what works and doesn't work and i think that um, the good relationship that we have with the wisconsin grass fed is built on that mutual respect of uh, complementary skills that we allow them to raise the animals and take them to the final customers and they allow us to provide feedback on what works best in our operation and and that mutual respect is what um, gets us a long ways but if you come in with some really opinionated um, very specific goals and not very much volume you'll find that we're kind of a challenge too. Great. Thanks for the response to that. Another question, and this can be something that uh, maybe back to you, Rod, if you want to field. The question is, uh, the audience member that submitted this would like to know your opinion on mobile processing units and specifically the feasibility of them being cooperatively owned. Sorry, Pete, was that a mobile processing unit, did you say? Yeah, mobile processing unit and the feasibility of it yeah. being cooperatively owned. Okay. No. Um, yeah. So again, love the thought, but our government doesn't exist to support businesses or to be uh, efficient. They exist to set standards and enforce them. Um, that said, I'm not being anti-government. It's just that um, you need a critical mass in order to pay for the inspector that would be at that facility and or mobile slaughter point. I've had so many people say, well, hey, Rod, why don't you just do USDA, you know, remote slaughter? Yeah, it's great, da, da, da. <laughs> well, that means you need to pay for a USDA inspector to be there, and that's a very, very complex. So love the idea, um, but I think in general terms, you're better off finding a local facility that has that expertise, whether it be state and or, or uh, federal inspectors on hand to give you the, the critical mass. Great, thanks for that, Rod. This question's for you, Mike. Uh, this individual is asking if you have any advice on developing a good modern slaughter and processing plant in central Minnesota. So just a just an easy question for you there, uh, but any advice uh, based on the experience that you've had uh, bringing your plant online? Central Minnesota is far too close to me, so I don't want you to develop one. I want you to come work with me. And will you be able to fund so, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, 
um, kind of within the theme of my presentation, success is self-identified. So, you know, whatever you want to do, you want to build a processing plant, fine, make a business plan, do the processing plant. Um, people can do it. I mean, my brother and I aren't rocket scientists. We figured it out. Um, it can be done, um, but it's a challenge, um, and it takes a way more capital than you'd hope for, and it's way more work than you'd hope for. And that's, you know, like the question about the mobile slaughter. You know, my initial reaction is I hate mobile slaughter. That's my, that's my um, inflammatory response. And what what it means is it's I, I feel like it's so hard for us to be in business when we get people to bring us an animal. I can't imagine adding the complexity of having to drive to a farm and get there and listen to some guy tell me an excuse about how he forgot to sort out an animal. It's just going to be an hour and a half or so before he can get out in the pasture and get that one. And I got my whole operation sitting idle waiting for it. So it can be a really challenge to run, run an operation. That said, if you have a guy that – excuse me, if you have a person whose passion is to be that sort of entrepreneurial, independent, make yourself a job, and you want to make Bob's mobile slaughter, you know, go knock yourself out. You can you can make a career, but, um, you know, you're only going to do, you know, a couple hundred head a year, so you're really not going to move the needle on how many people have access to grass-fed beef. You're at best going to serve a couple of your uh, farmer friends. Great. Thank you both for that uh, feedback. Next question, we have quite a few rolling in, so we'll just keep ticking along here. Um, and maybe Rod, uh, again, maybe start here, and I'm sure, Mike, you have uh, a lot of insight and perspective on this as well. Uh, this question is, what cuts benefit the most from being fresh, un or from fresh and unfrozen distribution? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick from a branded perspective. So everything we do on halves and whole steers is frozen. Um, but the market, the I guess the media, who whoever has done an amazing job at marketing fresh, you know, McDonald's, fresh, never frozen. Well, whatever. Uh, but they've done a great job at marketing that. So that's kind of the new standard. My point is what I tell people, A, as a rancher, everything I eat is frozen. Okay. B, I think the freezing thawing process actually tenderizes meat. However, um, our retail customers, and this is a great point, and this is the thing that we deal with with Mike, is uh, we, we, we work primarily 60 to 70% of our business is retail. <clears throat> retail means we, we process stuff to go to the co-ops, the Willie Streets, the outposts of the world, the uh, meat co-ops, the the da da that are going to cut fresh meat. And they want the stuff still moving. They want it yesterday, okay? Because they want retail freshness. And that's understandable because they, it's all aesthetic sells in America. Um, in terms of food service, they want things aged. And, uh, and that's a different discussion. But most of the freezer beef that you'll do, those guys also want two to three weeks of aging, which is a different subject that we I suggested to Pete. We might, may digress on if we have time. But if you're selling in a retail, you're going to want it super duper fresh and cryovac and if you're selling into food service and or freezer beef you'll want it frozen mike anything to add to that no i agree that the that fresh versus frozen distribution is a function of your end customer um and i don't think that it's product uh driven because i do think that freezing is the world's best preservative and you can have great products that are frozen correctly and thawed correctly excellent thanks for those responses next question and we'll stay on with you mike this one's directed to you and asking about if a producer can get any or, or you can get any value out of the hides blood fat offal etc um, in the processing process Yes, we can, and that's why Rod mentioned before about our processing prices being a little bit lower than a um, small plant is because we do uh, a reasonably good job compared to a small plant on gaining value from those things. Um, it, we have a real initiative to try to maximize that right now and try to 
do better because we see a lot of opportunity there. But um, so many of our small peers, that's a 100% cost center, and it really makes it hard for them um, to compete. And maybe, Mike, could you say a little bit more about, about how you, uh, some of the ways that, that you see those, the value can be created from those? And how does that work in terms of, is that just a value that for you as the processor, uh, or is there, is there some way that you know, uh, the producer um, could gain some value out of those as well? How does that typically work? Um, well, if you're bringing, you know, a couple beef a year, um, I don't see that it's going to be a big value. If you're doing a branded program, a thousand beef a year or more, yeah, our key branded customers, they probably are marketing a fair bit of bones, probably uh, marketing the majority of their edible um, organ meat. Um, you know, we do a lot of that stuff with those guys to help support them. Um, we have markets for the hide. We have markets for everything that's not edible. We actually get paid for. Um, so it all goes up to uh, the rendering in St. Paul, and we get a little bit of money for even the stuff that falls on the floor that's shoveled up at the end of the day. They pay us a little bit for it, and it ultimately the proteins go into the uh, animal feeds and the um, fats go into commercial uses. Um, so um, we're just seeing, you know, with our certified organic to try to do source of verified to get a little bit more and our 100% grass fed to do source verified. So uh, we see a lot of opportunities, but it, the, the scale of the customer that is buying those things is mind boggling. You know, we'll get, a, we'll get people that will ask us for a pallet of cow ovaries. I don't even know how many cows you have to kill to get a pallet of ovaries. You know, so that market isn't even available to us, but the big guys can get it. Um, I talked to a guy that worked on at Hormel, and they they squeeze the bile out of every uh, bile sack on a liver and the hogs, and they get a 2,000-pound bin every single day, and they sell that for big money every day. Well, you know, if you're a little custom locker plant that's doing 10 pigs, odds are you're not going to find money for that. So, so it does – it does get back to this getting to a scale where you can um, capitalize on some of that. That's the challenge. Great, thanks Mike. And Rod, here's a question for you and I think that it'll probably also get some feedback from Mike. Uh, this individual says that they're new to producing grass-fed beef and has heard people say that there's really tasty, uh, good tasting grass-fed beef and there's some that tastes not so tasty, tastes terrible, uh, meaning tough, bad flavor, et cetera. And they're asking, what are the variables that affect the flavor and the texture of the meat? And I'm gonna add a question onto the end of this. How does this uh, work in terms of the grading that happens uh, in, the, in the processing? Uh, great question, Pete, thank you. Um, I guess we'll go back to the beginning of time and on the first day there was light. Uh, unfortunately, the question is that long. Uh, there is grass-fed beef and there's grass-starved beef and there's a thousand iterations in between. So thank God for Mike and his team that uh, provide us with USDA grading. So one of our challenges was, you know, we, when we started a co-op, everything was grass-fed, everything was great. But as we all know, all grass-fed is not created equal. And what he gave us rather than yes or no, it was USDA quality scale grading uh, a live weight equivalent, a hanging weight equivalent, and any a carcass data. So now we're giving our producers not just, yeah, you made the grade or you didn't. We're gi giving them amazing data, which, uh, again, thanks to Mike and his team, that feedback makes us better. And as a big producer of our co-op, I, I, I just thrive on that. And I can't wait to get and see where did my cattle grade. And you know what? In the end, there was one, you know, number six. 64, I knew her mom, her grandmother had a little Holstein in her. She's not going to make it. And guess what? She was low. But everything else made choice. And that, you know, those are good things to see. So um, I think that's another great advantage of a, of, a, of a USDA plant and somebody like Mike where, you know, his team, they're, they're giving you the data. It's unbiased. It's uh, black and white. And in the end, that's really made our program. We, the grass-fed beef cooperative would not be in existence without the data that Mike gives us, because we now, we now pay based on grade. And if you've got a great choice, uh, world-class eating experience and the grass-fed health benefits, 
we'll give you top dollar. If it's you know marginal, we'll give you a marginal price. If it's sub-marginal, we'll give you a sub-marginal price. And if it's below standard and doesn't even make select, we give you a call call price. You know, we'll take it. But uh, it's really a great interactive tool that gives market value for, for market standards. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, again, we started at a state plant where things were yes or no, up or down, thumbs down, thumbs up. And now Mike has allowed us to really, really dig deep and have five different scales of grading, similar to what organic value does, I'm sure, um, and re reward those folks appropriately. Does that make sense, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. Anything you'd like to yeah. add into that, Mike? <clears throat> well, just a qualifier so, um, so I don't get in trouble. We do USDA equivalent grading with our master cutter, Chuck goes out and uses the USDA scale and reports them on that matrix, what they're, we do not roll at choice. Um, we, ha we would have to actually pay a USDA grader a lot of extra money to do that. And I'm not an advocate of paying USDA any extra money. So we do this as a service to Rod and their organization for the perpetual self-improvement thing. Um, so we use all their standards, but we use our staff to do it. Otherwise, we'd have to pay a little over $1,200 a day to have a grader stand there. And when you're only doing 50 head, $1,200 is a lot of money. Um, so that's a point of clarification. If somebody from USDA. But to the point, uh, Chuck is Chuck is like a world-class USDA grader, just uh, so people know this isn't a guy off the floor, Mike. He's oh, absolutely. He's got 44 for, years of experience in our facility, and exactly. he's got no dog in the fight, so he's going to be brutally honest. You know. He yeah, and he does all your cattle, because I've had one member right. say, well, which guy grades the, you know, the other cattle, the organic, organic right. valley cattle? He grades all the cattle, and he's even, and he doesn't right. know who's who's, who's, and he just, right. he's very, right. Yeah, he doesn't care um, because he wants to give honest data. Great. No, that's a good good points and good clarifications on that, and um, and uh, certainly something that folks should look into if they want to understand some of the different uh, grading that's out there. Um, it's uh, certainly good to understand where the thresholds are. Another couple questions here that we'll we'll tick through. Um, this is one that I'll direct to you, Mike. Uh, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit from what, how it was originally asked. Um, specifically, uh, how do you, uh, how does, do food service institutions such as schools or hospitals or universities, um, how do they fit into your business? And what do they create any unique opportunities uh, for certain products uh, to move on to those particular markets? Yeah. Um... All of our successful marketing companies have an institutional food service component to their operation. Um, Lawrence Meats sells work. All we do is sell work to people like Rod. We convert livestock into finished goods that can be saleable and meet those specs. So we're not out managing those relationships. Rod has to manage that relationship. The good news about that is um, so many um, mid-sized processing plants have their own sales force and their own branded programs that they own themselves. And if you go in and you get successful in open markets, they can just take them from you because they watch where their, the product goes and they can they probably underbid you. Um, we don't have a sales force. We're not going to go out there and try to do that. So um, the good news is we're not going to undercut you. The bad news is, is we don't we're not going to hand over that food service contact either because we don't have it. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, another question here. This one's for you directly, Rod. And the question is, what is your experience with consumer trends? Is there a growing demand for custom cuts? Okay. Is there a growth? In demand for custom cuts, yes. Um, so I'll just digress for a second. Um, it seems like the a lot of folks that got uh, a half or a quarter from Farmer Jones on the road, we get a lot of calls in the co-op. Hey, we used to get it from Farmer Jones, and you know he died, he turned over, he retired, whatever. So yes, the, the demand is still there. Um, I think the understanding of that experience is probably needs to be re 
reignited or reinvigorated because they they don't really understand the hanging time and all that stuff. So maybe a bit of work, but I th I think the opportunities there is a co-op. Um, not to give away our secrets, but we are really, really, really open to that experience. Because if you think of a think about the whole process, if you own from the you know the 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 meat going in to the end consumer, you you, you own the whole horizontal value chain, and retail these days is no joke. I mean, retailers, you can't live without them. It's a critical part of any business, but a 30 to 40% markup is a huge deal. So what we try to do is we try to take a 20% markup, eliminate everybody, everything else, and then pass it on and pass on a big savings to the end consumer and still, uh, you know, still make some money and, uh, and pass on a good deal. So yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, that works, for, works for us and it is changing, but uh, they're still there and it's still a big opportunity for the, uh, a smaller pro processor. Great. Mike, any, any insights or any thoughts on that? Are you seeing, uh, or noticing any trends, maybe not necessarily specific for the demand for custom cuts, but just changing trends within, uh, the market as a whole? Yeah, I see a lot of interest in the products that we're doing. You know, the retailers are hungry for new ideas. Uh, they, they're, they're looking for ways to differentiate themselves, um, but <clears throat> they're also very competitive. And, um, you know, I see um, customers of ours that are doing an excellent job and are getting shut out of, out of one retailer because they sold to another retailer. So those are all challenges that are await you if you try to go um, into the big uh, market and do distribution. And I would strongly encourage you all to uh, think smaller is better and get to that end consumer that's really interested in knowing where their food is coming from because uh, that is a trend that's also growing is that source identified product. Great, thank you both. So that wraps up all the questions that we have for this evening. Uh, we just have a, a, a few minutes left here and just wanted to uh, see if there were any final points uh, from either of our presenter, from Rod or Mike, uh, any final comments or recommendation advice to folks that are on the line that are maybe starting this journey and, and learning as they go. Uh, maybe a few take home points that you think are most important for folks to remember. I did want to chat real quick, Pete, about uh, hanging time. And uh, so if you read and if you're a big steak fan and read about the fantasies of steak and what makes a good steak or even a good uh, animal, you'll read about dry aging, wet aging, and those things may seem very perplexing. But <clears throat> in a nutshell, uh, dry aging is not often in the interest of your, your processor. So if you ask your processor directly, just, you know, reading about it and then going to your processor, they may say, oh, it's all hocus pocus. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant, but it is extremely relevant. So the, the point is it's not in the interest oftentimes to the state processor, especially because they have a limited storage base. They're not being paid to let it hang there. So if you are really into aging and the aging process, read about it, understand it, and then maybe um, either have your consumers age it themselves. You can wet age and they can wet age in their refrigerators uh, or find a processor that will answer your needs as a wet ager uh, and deal that appropriately. Thanks, Rod. Mike, any final thoughts or points that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up? Um, just that I have a lot of respect for um, programs, and like I started out with the conversation, I see big programs that are based on lies that aren't really real and on the verge of collapsing, and uh, and I see big programs that are successful. I see little programs that are just about to fall apart and little programs that are successful, and um, you are the one that controls that definition of success, and I wish everybody the I wish everybody that the success of executing their plan and, and doing whatever they need to do for their farm to keep it a viable operation. And hopefully you can find a processor that will fit those needs. <clears throat> Remember it says, you know, 
Bob's processing on the door because Bob's got his own plan. It might not necessarily be yours, and that's no offense to you, and you might have to drive a little farther than you want, but better to drive and get to somebody that's going to do it the way you need it and want it than to have to keep wringing your hands about some grumpy old meat cutter not doing it the way you want it. Great. Thanks for those final points, both Mike and Rod, and for the presentations as a whole. And finally, there's some contact information here for myself. Again, Pete Huff, uh, the program officer for the Pasture Project. Also, email for Rod and for Mike. Um, and I know that both of them are incredibly generous uh, with their uh, their knowledge and their desire to see good work go forward. So uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly if you have any questions about the Pasture Project uh, or if I can help provide any resources and information going forward. Again, this is recorded and we will try to get the recording up online as soon as possible. And with that, we will wrap for the evening. So thank you for joining, for joining us on tonight's webinar. And we look forward to having you back on a Pasture Project webinar in the future. Have a good night.